Okay, this is Brevard County Historical Commission Oral History Video Project. An interview with Marion Grant in Merritt Island, Florida, February the 6th, 1994. Interviewer Nancy Iseko, cameraman Robert Gilbert. Camera Sony DXCM7, recorder Sony BVW35. Copyright Brevard County Historical Commission, 1994. Tell us your name and where you were born and when. Marion Hatton Hallenquist, LaRoche, after I got married, of course. I was born in Charleston, South Carolina, in Roper Hospital at noon, 12 o'clock. And that's odd, because I'm a night person. Well, your family came to Florida before that, though, didn't they? When did they come? They came to Florida in 18, I mean, 19, what do I mean? 1876 or something like that, way back yonder. Uh -huh. And then they went back home, and then they got, came, some of them, and then they got lonesome for the ones who stayed, and they came back. They were from South Carolina, which had suffered greatly during the Civil War. That's right. That must have they been lost part of everything. The they came south, I guess. I don't know exactly why they came to Florida, really, except that John Sams, my mother's brother, had come and they came out to see him and liked it. It was just a wilderness there. Mm -hmm. One house on this a whole island. Do you know why they picked Merritt Island of all places? I have no idea. And what was the, the town that they decided to settle in, in Merritt Island? Well, ma they settled up in Courtney, but the house that they, the only house that was on the island was way down there, and I can't remember, it was where the Osteens lived and the Stewarts. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, Indianola was here, but we did, I don't know why we didn't settle here. There weren't too many children around. I, yeah, well, back yonder, the, the, all of them had children, of course, which played together. I'm the only one that came along and had nobody to play with. Because we lived a mile and a half north, south of everybody else. Li which is north and south here? Um, that way is going to be south. Well, I, we lived south of Courtney, south Courtney, and the, the rest of them lived either in Courtney or north. Courtney. There was a little school there. One little school, one little room. My mother was a teacher and taught eight grades. And uh, one day she looked out the window and this little boy, uh, that's the second story about a snake. He'd run a few feet and then he'd stoop down and try to pick something up and so she went out to investigate. And it was Brady Sam's and there was a little brown rattler. And he was trying to pick it up and if he had of of course, it could only bite you. They are so tiny, and their mouth is so small that if you have shoes, you're safe. But of course, if they'd have bitten him on his finger, it would have been curtains because we were so many miles from a doctor or any place. I guess you ran into a rattler once too. When you oh yeah, I used to practice uh, croquet, and Mamma's Papa saw me going under this tree, so he went to investigate. And the snake was coiled, and the ball had rolled right up into the coil, and I was just stooping down to pick it up when he killed the snake. What kind of snake was that? Rattlesnake. And I have the rattles. I guess there were a lot of snakes. We had, yes, and I, I've had a lot of things. Right on this place, I was walking one day when my sister-in-law grabbed me. And I, uh, I stepped, uh, Sam stepped over the snake, and I don't know why Sam didn't see it. But then I was uh, about to step, step over it when she grabbed me back. We'd, that was a six-foot snake. <laughs> there, there was other wildlife here. Bears, wildcats. Mama used to be scared to death because, have you ever heard a wildcat? cry out. Well, it sounds like a woman in agony. It really does. And Papa, when he would uh, 
be off at night and this cat would scream. And you know, oh, when they first, Mama's, Papa's first home didn't have any doors and windows, you know. It just had cloth hanging up in the doors and windows until they could get them shipped in. Kind of worry about some of the wildlife <laughs> coming in, wouldn't you? My mother was a city girl. Now, that wouldn't have bothered me so much, but it, it, Mama was very scary about country things, mm -hmm. wildlife and all. Papa stumbled one day and fell and knocked himself out. And when he came to, this bear was straddling him, nuzzled his neck and sniffed around his ears and his eyes and his hair. And finally the bear went that way. And Papa said he got up and ran <laughs> that way just as fast as he could go. But they had lots of wild tales to tell. Did he ever go hunting? No, he didn't like hunting. He didn't like killing. They only killed when they had to have food to eat. He, fi he used to like, he used to fish some. Papa spent most of his time planting vegetables and he had a gar beautiful garden. And Pap Mama had the most beautiful roses you've ever seen in your life. Where would she get the starts for those? Would she? I have no idea. I was just a little girl. But she'd send off and get them. Of course, they didn't have mail or anything. They had the old Hiawatha, which I have a picture of. And it would go once a week to Coco. When you say Hiawatha, what do you mean? A boat, Uncle Dick's boat. And Uncle Bob had the red wing. And one day, <laughs> Aunt Lee stepped, Aunt Lee was very dignified. And she stepped onto the red wing when all of a sudden it began to drift like this. And she, her feet went further and further and further apart and in the water she went. <laughs> if it had happened to Aunt Maddie, it wouldn't have been so funny because she was a, a daredevil, but Aunt Lee was so dignified and so proper. <laughs> <laughs> um, what kind of boats were these? I can't tell you, were just they, a boat. Were they powered or sailed? Well, or? the Red Wing, well, had a cabin. Well, they both had cabins. But uh, the, Hi the Hiawatha really was to carry groceries and, and fruit. See, there was no packing house when they first came here. But you know, I'm go I've gone for a full circle. Mama and Papa and Uncle Dick and all built a big packing house, which they all worked in. Now my daughter and son-in-law have built a small packing house, which they work in. And they're packing more, a lot of their own fruit. Some of the same trees, I guess. No, no all of these are new trees. I gave, Joe, I gave Joe the grove and he asked me if I would mind if he took out the old trees and planted new ones. And I told him, no, I turned over the grove to him. He could do anything. And so he planted these trees. Joe is your son? Son-in-law. Son-in-law. Well, your father started a lot of citrus trees. Yes, and he got, I guess it came from the Dunnett Grove. I don't know where else it would come from. But I, I, he'd cut the trees and, you know, squeeze out the fruit, and he'd plant uh, while he was waiting for the grove to come along is when he had the vegetables and all. And uh, it's all told in much better in the book than I'm telling it now. Yeah, well, it's hard to remember exactly, but he would ship his fruit out by boat. Yeah. And I guess pretty much everything happened by boat. Everything. There was no roads. None at all. And the first roads were very crooked, and the reason for that was people would just turn the horses, you know, let the reins dangle, kind of, and the horses would have to go around roots and you know, round puddles, and around trees. So the first roads were very crooked. You'd have thought it was a drunk man making. <laughs> Do you remember when the first automobile started showing up around here? I was 12 years old when we had our first car, an Essex. And the second car was an Essex. Where would you go in your car? Well, we'd go on these country roads, and then the bridge came. Well, Papa didn't get our car until the bridge came in. 
and we'd go, it was only, you know, a very narrow bridge. A car going this way, and, and sometimes they'd have a time passing each other if they happened to be a little bit wide. Did you go, you go over to Coco, or did go you ever Coco. go all the way to Orlando? Well, not, not then. The roads were horrible. What we, I guess I was in my teens before we began going to Orlando. That was a big city, <laughs> although I was from Charleston, South Carolina. I, I visited, every summer we went back to see Dr. John, my brother. How would you get up to South Carolina? On a train. Uh-huh. Take bought, it out of Cocoa? Yeah. Catch the train. Take the boat to Cocoa and then the train to... Well, that was when we had a car then. No, well, first we went by, by a boat, and I broke out with measles on the train one time. And so they shut us up in one park corner. <laughs> the conductor was furious. My mother said, well, she didn't have measles when I put her in the car. You saw that. So I was taken to the Knox Hotel in Coco, and we were quarantined until Papa could come over for us and take me home. I was a very inconsiderate child. <laughs> <laughs> um, what hotels do you remember? Well, the Knox, and then they had a, a beautiful hotel on the river, but I can't remember the name of it. Coco House, I believe. It was a Coco yeah. House. Yeah. And they had this little thing built over the river. When they'd feed the ducks, people would go out. It was a dock with a, this little room, you know, with a shed mm -hmm. over it. What other businesses do you remember going to? Was there, uh, you met there a little store in Coco? Hardware? There was a... a I wish I could. I had a better memory than I've got. They, that was a clothes store, and Travis was there, and it had everything except clothes. And a fish store that you could smell for miles. And Dr. Hewlett was there. And you, you know how Coco is built now, with trees out in. He had one tree that he loved in front of his office, and you know they made him cut that tree down, and it only went, say, here's a road. Say, a place like that was built out, but he had to cut that tree down. Coco was absolutely, it was beautiful when it was first started. Then they got in mares and all that believed in absolutely straight trees and no obstructions, so they cut all the trees down. Now look at it again. Put some trees back. They put in, right in the middle of the streets almost. Do you remember going to Dr. Hewlett? Yes, he was our only doctor. What was he? Well, there was a Dr. Counts, too. Mm -hmm. Well, he was, lots of people liked him. I, I wasn't particularly fond of him, but I was just a kid. Was there a dentist in town, too? Or? No, thank goodness, we had to, I didn't need one, but we had to go to Orlando. For dentist, oh, and they, well, they did have one in Titusville, Dr. Lichtenberg. I was sent to Atlanta when I was twelve because I had my uh, my teeth protruded, mm -hmm. and they had to, I had to wear gold bands, and there was no dentist except Orlando, and we couldn't get to Orlando every week. <laughs> it was easier to get to Atlanta. So, <laughs> so Mama and my, my brother lived in Atlanta, so I went up to live with them for two years. And you went to school up there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Girls High. And then I went to a boarding school for three months, which I loved. Where was that? Well, it's destroyed now. It was a big school on Presbyterian Avenue. I say a big school. It was a big house. And they had the back porch and the front porch. The people believed in children being exposed to the weather, so we slept on this huge poaches, these two huge poaches. And one time we decided we were going to have a picnic at night. So all of a sudden they said, here comes the house mother. 
So we had to get rid of the cakes and the pies, and I put mine, I don't know why I put it there, but the next time when, when at 12 o'clock, I was washing my head, I'd put my head in a lemon pie. <laughs> and I had long hair then. That was up in Atlanta? In Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Well, there, there were some little schoolhouses around here, but there wasn't much. Well, Courtney School had, had one school that I went to until I graduated in the, from mm -hmm. in the eighth grade. And luckily, we had a good teacher. My mother was an excellent teacher. Now, I'm just saying what other people said. But I, being the daughter, people, Aunt Lee's, for instance, said, Mamie, why are you so hard on, Mam on Marion? Even they noticed it. But Mamma didn't want people to say that she was showing partiality. So I, they, she was very strict with me, which probably didn't hurt. Mm. I hear I was very mischievous. You caused trouble. <laughs> well, not any bad trouble, but I never could keep quiet. At school? Any time. I guess that was in a time when children were supposed to be quiet. Seen and not heard. <laughs> Um, what about special occasions like Christmas and things like that? What what y'all do here? Well, they always had, we had to make our ornaments for the tree because there was no electricity. And we had candles, but we had to put them out if we left the room on account of fire, you know. So, but the trees, as I remember it, we had beautiful pine trees and we'd make most of our presents. It was fun. What kind of presents would you make? Well, children, I'd make these. The, I don't know how to do it now, but it was be, be loops, you know, with the, the we'd fold the paper a certain way and then we'd loop it in. That's how the tree was decorated. And Mama sewed beautifully and embroidered beautifully. And so we had in, in bureau scarves. And Mama had, unfortunately, though, Mama had made my own clothes because there was no place to buy them. And she believed in making everything. If you were eight years old, she bought an eight-year-old pattern. And if I was a small child, <laughs> so my clothes didn't always fit. <laughs> had to grow into them. I had to grow into them. Hmm. Were there um, times when everybody in the community would get together? Oh, we'd yeah. Have? We'd have once a week, everybody, you'd go out and spend the day. Then once a week, somebody always came and spent the day with you. So we, we worked hard in the week, but we had fun on Saturdays and Sundays. Mm -hmm. And we had that little Courtney church. Have you ever seen that? I guess I have. Well, it, they've got a big church now built up there, much larger, but it's copied from the Courtney church. And... Uh, of course, we went to church, every, and Mama and Papa both had beautiful voices. They had an old organ. It was, it was fun. How big was the congregation, as you recall? Well, sometimes it'd only be two or three people. Sometimes it'd be 20, <laughs> 30. <laughs> uh, was there a pastor that lived here, or did he come No, he had to... He had uh, Mr. Uh, Cresson was the name of one of them, and he kind of looked like Santa Claus. He had white hair, round, and my idea of Santa Claus, anyhow. He serviced a number of parishes, or yes, he'd go. He'd uh, he did Indianola, Courtney. And now the, all of the Georgiana and uh, Lotus, uh, that's the name of the place. And several, he'd just go up and down the river. And we had a doctor, that's how the doctor, you know, there was no doctor. Dr. Holmes was our first doctor and he'd, if, if we needed him, I don't know, there were no telephones, I don't really know how, how there'd be word of mouth, you know. And he'd go up and down the river in a boat, and travel every every month. You'd get a 
visit from the doctor whether you needed it or not. Well, it might have been a pretty good way to go. Well, luckily we were all healthy. I, can, I was hardly ever sick. Well, look at there. We had absolutely fresh air to breathe. No gasoline fumes or anything in the air. Our land was not depleted. We had veg fresh vegetables. Chickens and ducks and everything were eating good food. You know, the land is kind of depleted now. If you didn't fertilize, for instance, you wouldn't raise anything. But back there, you really didn't have to fertilize. Well, that makes sense. The land was good. But it looked like sand, didn't it? I mean, it well, we lived half of my, we happened to have a place that looked like sand. Catherine Jenkins, my cousin, their place, she, she's written a book where the, the land in Florida is dark sod, sod. Mine would be white sand, but she lived down where the, by the creeks and all, where the land was just black and hard. And Uncle, Uncle Harry used to raise vegetables, I mean, uh, well, he raised vegetables too, but he'd steal the eggs from the alligators. He'd go down, he, he nearly got killed one time. He got, he poked his hand down into the alligator cave or whatever you call it and there was a rattlesnake that he uh, he saw it just as he did and he grabbed its head and the rattlesnake was big and wrapped itself around his arm and he had to walk four miles and if he'd gotten uh, he, he almost had to let loose his hand was becoming paralyzed and they cut his the snake's head off before you know or he'd have been killed all kinds of things happened to him where he went to find the nearest neighbor, I guess. No, he went home where his family lived, and they, they, uh, then he, he had a weird sense of humor. He had two little girls, and he liked to play jokes on the mother. So she went to Sunday school. The two little girls were too little to go. So he painted them red, white, and blue, <laughs> and sent them out to meet the mother. Naked as the day they were born, painted red, white, and blue. She was furious. She wouldn't speak to him for weeks. <laughs> Don't mention his name. The family might get mad. <laughs> but it really happened. You had to make your own entertainment. Oh, yes. We went up to Uncle Harry's one day, and I was sitting in the swing, and there was a cat bathing. It's, you know, how they lick their hands, and sitting here and there was a cat here and I don't know why we were watching the cat and I don't know why the cat did what it did but all of a sudden this cat jumped down just as this cat jumped up and their heads went together <laughs> in midair like that you could hear it and one cat went one that way and one cat went the other way and we never saw the cats the rest of the day but y'all laughed oh it was funny <laughs> mm. Well, there was a time, I guess, they used to have regattas on the Indian River, sailboat races. And My father was a great sailboat racer. Yeah, that, I, of course, I came a long way too late for that. I wasn't born until my father was 56. I don't even remember him until he was 60. The, um, let's see, other things, there were May Day picnics. Do you remember any of those? Only I had one. I, my teacher was Mama, except for the first two years I had a Miss Dewey. And she'd, she'd have those kind of things. But the school was much smaller when she had it. And she had time. My mother had, my mother never went to bed till one or two o'clock at night. She had to grade all those papers. And she was a, she was a good teacher. When we had an exam, I'm telling you, it was an exam. On the whole year, what we'd done in school. You used ink wells and fountain pens. Yeah, we had. I've, I've got one of the old desks down in the garage. One of the, the the seat was the desk was here, and then it'd have a seat in front, and you know the desk and the seat in front. 
did the little boys really put the girls' hair in the ink well? They did everything. Most all of them were, we've all kin though. Double first cousins and first cousins and second cousins. Now a double, you know what a double first cousin is? I think so. The three sisters married three brothers, for instance, that Jack made the children first cousins on each side. And the, ro the ro roaches, when they found a family they liked, they stuck to it. For instance, the Stewarts, and four or five La Roche brothers married four or five La Roche uh, Stewart girls. My father's, of course, married the Helen Quist girls. That's a name to give a child, have a child have to spell, isn't it? <laughs> no. We'd have spelling bees. All kinds of things. We had to carry our own lunch to school, of course, because there was no way of buying anything. What about when it got cold? Well, it wasn't, it wasn't too cold then. We had, we still walked to school. It rained. What about mosquitoes? We had them too. <laughs> Plenty of them. We had a, kept a smudge in front of the two doors. That's, I don't know how you make them now, I've forgotten, but it was, it, 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 the, the cloth would just smolder. It never would light up, you know, I mean flare up, but just the smoke, and you, you didn't dare open a door without that smudge. But just look, when Mama and Papa first came, they had to hang, hang netting up in the window. Have you ever slept behind netting? And then sleep, uh, slept, uh, sleep under netting, too. I'm telling you, they, it was hot. We didn't have any fans. And just have to sleep that way. But then I can remember when we got the first wire in the window. Oh, it was so much cooler. Wire screen. Because mm -hmm. they let a little air through. Let much more air through than the netting did. I wonder why that was. The holes were about the same size. Well, I don't know. But it was, well, of course, you weren't sleeping under the cotton netting either then. We, we'd have these huge things hung up like that with frames out this way that the netting would be, and then it would come down. But now you know that kept a lot of fair air out. There'd probably be a few mosquitoes in there when you got in. Still. Would you try and get rid of them? We'd have to. <laughs> before you went to sleep? We'd all sit up and... Of course, I slept upstairs. Mama and Papa had a bedroom downstairs. Of course, when I came along, all the rest of the children were gone. I was raised alone. But Papa and Mama, as I told you, had beautiful voices, and they'd sing to me, and Mama and Papa would tell me stories. And they'd read, read to me. So I, no, I, I never can remember being... Well, I can do remember praying for some little kid to come to see me that day so I could have somebody to play with. Mm -hmm. Occasionally God even answered my prayers. <laughs> but you see, I lived so much further out. The children couldn't come by themselves. They had to come with, with the parents had to bring them. Now the children that lived in Courtney could run from house to house. But Uncle Ben's family was like that, Sally didn't have many people to play with and I didn't because she lived a mile and a half that way from Courtney and I lived a mile and a half this way from Courtney. Well, that's a long mile and a half when there are no roads. Well, when you're six and seven years old too, they Is there anything left of where Courtney was? Well, and Maddie's house is gone. The two churches, the one church is there and then another one that's built. And, uh, Aunt, Aunt Lisa's house is still there, and I'm trying to think. The, the Walter LaRoche's house is there, Frankie LaRoche's house is there, and uh, Sally Dingman's house is there. She's at Patsy Wel Welts now. You ought to see her. Now she can give you a history. And uh, her house, as I understand it, now if you see her, you may get a different story. Part of it was floated down the river from some place and dragged up to where it is now. I don't think they use that part, but it's still there. And that's just south of the Space Center area now. 
this is south and that's north, that's isn't it? North, yeah. Yes, it's south. <laughs> <laughs> my directions. Mm. My daughter and I, we get us together and we are lost. Like Marion said, where do you turn here? And I told her, and of course we were lost. I said, well, Marion, why did you ask me? I told you I always got lost in that town. Mm. As many times as I went through it, I always made the same mistake. Looks like I would have learned. Which town is that? Some town in uh, Alabama. Um, going to town meant going to Cocor. It might have meant going to Orlando. Going to town meant going to Orlando. That, uh, I mean, I could, uh, well, not at first. Going to town meant going to Cocor. But then after we got accustomed to going to Coco, going to town meant to Orlando. And Orlando wasn't much bigger then than Coco is now. What was that like going to Orlando? Oh, it was fun. We had planned for it a week ahead of time. You'd get up early in the morning, and it was an all-day excursion. You'd be so tired. <laughs> and my, when Marion was a little girl, when Sam and I, we'd tell her that we'd walk around, what is that lake, Lake uh, Eel? Something like that. It's a beautiful lake. And we'd tell her if she'd just hang around and do whatever we, because of course she'd be bored, we'd walk around Lake Eola with her. And so every trip we'd have to walk around Lake Eola. Well, there were things in Orlando you couldn't get around here. Well, yeah, plenty of things. But that was a highlight. And of course we didn't have good roads then like we do now. You might have a flat tire getting there. One day going to the beach, which of course was quite a treat too to us, there must have been 60 flat tires. This man who was selling tacks, the back door came open and it, these tacks were falling out. And they wanted to arrest him, but he didn't know it. I mean, they really wanted to punish him for it, but he didn't know it. Look at all the tax he lost. <laughs> As someone pointed out, you put him in jail and he'll sue you for stealing his tax. <laughs> but I have never seen such, such a bunch of mad people in my life. Luckily, we didn't get manage to get... Sam had a... Tr we went in the truck that day instead of the car. And you know, the truck tires are much thicker. So if we picked up the... the tax it didn't make it go flat but that was really funny oh, so you passed all these cars we passed all these cars and I guess once you get two flat tires there's not much you can do <laughs> some of them had four because even when they patched one they still had to get off the road you know and they'd go two or three more feet and have another one <laughs> That was over 50 years ago because I don't think Miriam was born then. That was you on know, the road to the beach? Mm -hmm. I don't, it's funny. I feel the same as I did. Of course, I don't look the same, but I haven't aged. I mean, I'm, the same things that interested me then still interest me. Of course, my health is good. Let me knock on wood. I'll die tonight of some unknown disease. <laughs> I heard a story once that, that they used to have cattle out here on Merritt Island. That was really, that was going out just as I was moved here. Mm. Yeah. That, uh, I think it was two years we still had of that because the people let their cattle run wild. And of course you had to, you had to fence in your groves to protect your groves from the cattle. Then they changed that. But I, I was scared to death of cows, but that was on account of an experience I had when I was just a little girl. I was, my life was saved by a young black boy eating a watermelon. My mother, father took me down to the store, and this happened in Rockville, South Carolina. And uh, he went in the store to talk, and I left me outside. When this fellow, I was mesmerized. I simply didn't move. This huge bull had gotten loose and was bearing down on me, you know, mad, snorting. And this black boy said, Lord of mercy, that's Mr. John's child, and grabbed me. Just the bull tore my clothes. 
just as in Mamma, was, of course they would, didn't have much money then, but Mamma made him clothes and shirts and things like that. And uh, I think he, I think they even gave him five dollars, which was a thousand dollars now. <laughs> Yes, so. I think that's why I've always liked black people. I mean, you know, after all, I owe my life to one. Then another time, Mama looked up and I was told not to step off the sidewalk. This was in Charleston. Well, I wasn't a particularly obedient child, so I stepped off the sidewalk right in the middle of the two rails. And this trolley car was coming down. It was an incline like this. He was trying to stop, and his bell was clanging, but I was mesmerized. I just couldn't take my eyes off of this huge thing, and a white man that time saved my life. So I've had my life saved twice. Mm. I like white men, too. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, there are very few people I don't like. Um, speaking of the black community, was there a black community here on the island, or do you recall? Well, this, uh, just like it is now, they've had, they've got their homes. You've been up and down the river, the road. Well, they always like to congregate together. But when we first came here, all the black people went to the white churches because there weren't the one but the one church. We all went to the same church. So you got to know each other. Oh yeah. I've always liked black people. I don't find them any different. Let's see what else I've got on the list here. Oh, what about hurricanes and other natural disasters? Oh, I almost lost my life in a hurricane one time. You know how the a lull comes? When I, I had better sense to do this, but I just had this little tiny flashlight, so I went outside. I knew that it, it, the rest would strike me soon. But with this little flashlight, you couldn't see very much. And the next day, you could see my footprints. The line had gone down. You see, I had no lights in the house. And my footprints weren't but about this far from a live wire, the one that came into the stove. It would have killed me. And I, I, my footprints were just, I just managed to m walk all around that line without touching it. But if I'd have died then, it would have served me right, because I knew better. So when was that? That was one of the hurricanes. Yeah, that we've had some yeah. pretty big storms. It was after Marion and Joe were married, because I was living here, I was by myself. Marion would have never let me do anything like that. She's much more sensible than me. <laughs> mm. Well, there was some... Um, but you know, people think I'd, I'm scary here, but I've always figured God can look after me here, whether I'm alone or not, just as well as he could if I lived in, um, in a bunch of people. I'm not, I'm not a bit scary. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, a time here after the, the banks all crashed. Oh boy, Mama, Papa lost everything he had. Everything. Must have been All right. of us did. Yeah. And the worst part of it is this old black woman had saved her money by putting it under a mattress and people kept telling her, trying to explain to her that if she put her money in the bank, she could draw interest. So finally she decided to do it. And as she was, they were closing the doors to this bank as she walked up. And she told them she wanted to deposit some money. Now this white man, the head of the president of the bank, let that woman go in and deposit her money. I think he ought to be horsed with. I really do. Because they were closing the bank. It had already failed when they took that woman's money. She lost every cent. Now I think that... I, of all the crooks, I think that man was the crookedest. Who was that? I don't know who ever happened to be the president of the Barnett Bank at that time. That was a long time ago. That was right that over was, here. Yeah, but it wasn't in, it wasn't, he wasn't in that big building now. Mm -hmm. It was just a small bank. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember his name. 
You had to get by with just what you could grow? and Then you got by. Of course, we were right back where we started. Papa has still had to, he had his grove. Mm -hmm. It was already in bearing. But, and vegetables and the things that we'd raise and the fish. Now, when I, my life was divided. When I was a little girl, I hardly ever went on the river. Then I got married to Sam, and of course, he lived on the river. He just loved it. We'd own boats and go up and down the river, and he liked to fish. And my job was when he was fishing with a net, which I made him, by the way. It, it, he said it was the best net he'd ever had. It opened up. It would have touched that side and this side, and I, I crocheted or netted. What do you call it? Well, anyway, that's the net he used, and he could open it in an absolute perfect circle. But then my job was to push the boat, the rowboat, while he was gathering up the net and the fish. And my, uh, my trip to him, instead of being a straight line to boat, go this way and that way, I never could do anything with boats. They have minds of their own, that way and that way. <laughs> Sam said, if you'd push it straight, Marion, you wouldn't have so far to go. <laughs> but I couldn't push it straight. It, boats, I, I, I'm with a boat like, a, like I am with an electric light. I mean, a bu if I punch a button, things are supposed to happen. If they don't happen, I'm lost. Your husband was a fisherman? Oh, he loved to fish. No, he grew oranges just like everybody else. Now, he did fish two years, though. He'd catch so many, he couldn't, he didn't, we didn't like to waste anything. We'd take them over and sell them. Over to Coco? Mm hmm. Was his family uh, from around here? The fields were. The fields came from Georgia. And uh, his father, came directly from Scotland. He was raised in Edinburgh and went to the Edinburgh University. He came down here and married a little, fell in love with a little 15-year-old girl, married her, Annie Grant. The, the Ola and Eliza, she was a tiny little woman. But she, she married one of the fields. There was John Fields and Sam Fields and another Fields that I didn't know. She married John Fields. They had, uh, you know, you, you, uh, Papa bought his place, but they used to come out at, what do you call it? And homestead. Homestead. This was a homestead. Mm -hmm. You see, uh, John Fields had th three children a son and two daughters, so he gave half the place to the son, and then he divided the other half up between the two girls. And Dad married one of the girls, so this is that place, and then that place over there that Joe owns now was the other girls, except that he didn't buy the houses. He only owns the grove. Mm -hmm. Quite a change from Scotland to <laughs> <laughs> What was that, Samuel? Samuel Bevere the very dad would get up on a his name was S I M S O N. Not S I M P but S I M Simpson. But they called him Sam Bevere the Vitter because he'd get up on the desk and recite this long thing, you know. <laughs> he was a wonderful man. They sent Sam off to school when he wasn't but eight years old. His, he lost his mother when he was very young, she died. And they sent him off to boating school, and I think it's cruel to send a child that young off. But of course, he, he wasn't married, but somebody could have taken care of him. It's funny, I lived right up there, only six miles from Sam, and we didn't meet until I, he was 15 and I was 16. But my, the rest of my family knew him. But you see, they had younger parents than I did. I was born to old parents. And they didn't go around like the younger parents did. So I missed out on all of that. But I made up for it. I'm the one that married him. <laughs> well, you got married around here? In the Courtney Church. Yeah, what was your wedding like? Well, it was small, but it, it was beautiful, really. I had uh, a cousin of mine owned a, a florist shop. 
And for their, their present to me was they decorated the church and it was absolutely beautiful. And then they decorated my daughter's church too when she came along. Marion was married in the same church that I was and Laurie and Chris were married in the same church. They, they didn't want to be married in the new church. They wanted to be married in the old church. In the little church. Yeah. One day I went up there, they, I'd worked all day and he was having these, uh, I guess you'd call it studies, you know, Bible studies. And I got in late and I s saw this little frog. Well, I didn't pay any attention at first. He was in the aisles. And then I got to thinking, now, several people haven't come yet. I'd better move that little frog because they'll step on him accidentally. So I reached for him and he hopped. So I reached a little further and he hopped. Well, then, of course, I was forgot where I was, so I got down on one knee, and the next thing I know this voice says, and where do you think you're go doing, Mrs. Grant? And the priest, <laughs> I was crawling up the aisles trying to catch a frog, <laughs> and where do you think you're going, what do you think you're doing, Mrs. Grant? <laughs> I could have killed him, <laughs> but I caught the frog. <laughs> well, things were a little less formal, <laughs> that still sounds like. Well, I, I would have never done it if I hadn't have forgotten where I was. <laughs> you don't usually <laughs> crawl up an eyes in a church. <laughs> so how'd your husband feel about that? Well, he was dead then. I, that, oh. that happened not too long ago. Oh, dear. Um, but going back, do you remember anything about what it was like here during World War I? What was going on? You would have been... Just a, little a little girl. Well, I remember I had a brother in the war and my mother could hardly wait. Of course, we didn't get the mail, but about once a month, once every two months, and we would just be sitting on the edge of our seats, so to speak, wondering what about Laurent. And you know, Laurent was the brother, I mean, John tried to get into the war, but uh, he couldn't. He was a very slight man and he did everything he could but they wouldn't take him. And uh, they said, besides, and Sam tried to get into the other wall, but they wouldn't take him because at that time he was doing work for the government. He had two huge, he had two grove tractors and two drivers, and he had two huge tractors with this, these huge uh, harrows, and he was harrowing the palmetto scrub and all and raising grass. And they asked him one day, how do you, what do you do? Because he had, all of his grass grew, nobody else's was growing. And Sam, all of a sudden, he didn't know what he was doing that was different. He wasn't a, his work was machinery, not, not growing grass. So he thought, he had to say something. So he said, well, he says, I think it is because I don't level off the ground when I get through. And the pockets of water gather, you know, in the harrow marks and the other people's grasses, uh, they, they level the ground and the water runs off and the seeds can't sprout. Well, that happened to be the truth. But Sam <laughs> said he was stunned when he was asked to tell why his grass was growing. So after that, they quit. They began doing that and their grass grew too, so he knew that that was the right answer. Well, that was a good thought. Well. Imagine it. Um, during World it, War II, there was some rationing. Oh yeah, my lord! And uh, you were even if you had your own cow, you weren't supposed to drink but so, so much of the milk. And I, Sam said, "What are you going to do? Throw away the rest of it?" We didn't. What was the sense? We ate it. We didn't throw it away. <laughs> they did have some of the stupidest laws, really. You were supposed to, if you didn't have anybody to give it to, you were supposed to have only, say, so, ma so much butter. What were you going to do the with the rest of it? Of course, we could have been put in jail, but we weren't. Well, <laughs> I imagine around here you weren't the only ones in that situation. Well, it was, then we, uh, they got up on tops of houses and watched for these planes, you know. Well, Sam paid somebody to do it for him. He didn't do it himself. You could hear the planes. Why did you have to watch for them? And you, and out here, we had to shutter every window. 
I mean, put cloth over it or not turn on our lights. Look at Cocoa Beach. They didn't have to. I mean, they didn't. The whole line of lights. Huh. I mean, people were just, I, people are stupid sometimes. Now, let's face it. I said I had common sense. That's the only kind I've got. <laughs> But I just don't fall for that, those kind of things. Yeah, over on the beach, some people talk about there were uh, German submarines that were... They were supposed to be. There weren't any German submarines. Yeah. They'd have shot at us if they had been. The only people they couldn't have seen was us. They could see the people over there. Yeah. Now, who's going to come up in this river, for instance? It's, it's, a submarine couldn't even submerge. It's not, it's not deep enough. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty far from the action. Though. <laughs> I mean, really, some of the laws in this land are ridiculous. There's plenty of them now. <laughs> The, the land values went up and down, what with the, the big bust in the 20s and 30s? And then Sometimes uh, 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 a little, uh, uh, well, I can't explain it exactly. You'd be, one day you were worth absolutely nothing. The next day you were a billionaire, and then all of a sudden you were worth nothing again. <laughs> That's just the, the way it was. But we didn't sell our land, we kept it. As Sam said, what would we do? We'd only buy it back. <laughs> well, there's getting to be a lot more people around. Well, where I still would, as Joe was telling me the other day, he said, you don't have to worry, as long as I'm alive, this place will still be in the family. Of course, eventually, I guess, it'll be all the city. It's getting that way now. Then they were, there was a threat one time they were going to bring in a railroad from Orlando. Well, now, they, first they were going to put it over here, take half of the fields place. Now, that would have been a ridiculous thing. But then they decided if, they, if it comes in, it's going to go by the Barge Canal, which is a sensible thing for it to do. So I'm safe. <laughs> <laughs> can't count on people being sensible. No, no. <laughs> you certainly can't. Absolutely not. Did the, the um, space program coming in have much effect on this area for you? Or? Well, of course, I worked over at RCA. And uh, we had, I, uh, you couldn't have, uh, we had to park our cars. It was re very unsettling. Uh, it was away from the building. Then we were allowed to go out. I worked from 3 to 12 at night. Then about 7 o'clock we were the, when the first thing got off, the people. They were still there when I got there. Oh. But then they'd leave and I was allowed to go out then and we could move our cars up close then. Where was that building? Was that you know that great big building down there almost to uh, Titusville, the, the big building right on the island. I mean, right on the ocean. Okay. Um, I, I've forgotten the name of it. Is it part of the space center out there? It and was, go yeah. Go through the gate and everything? Yeah. And uh, the first thing, time I was there, I had parked, and I, before I had a chance to get out, this black man was walking up the steps, but all of a sudden he fell. Well, I thought he'd stumble, but he hadn't. He'd had a heart attack and died going up the steps. And we, we worked in a building that had no windows, no, no anything. I bet you mean down, down near Patrick Air Force yeah. Base? At the tech lab? Or the what? tech lab. That's where I worked first. Uh -huh. And uh, my job was to, every time they spotted a plane or anything, I had to phone in, you know, to the different mathematicians. Every time, they, I don't mean spotted a plane. Launched a rocket. Yeah. I had to phone in. I never was so sick of phones in my life. There were nine mathematicians that I had to phone this information. I'd phone it in and 
then they'd change, hold him three minutes, so I'd have to phone him in and tell him it was being held for three minutes. Then they were going to shoot, so I'd have to phone it in. And <laughs> I was sick to death of phones. Well, where were you calling? Local numbers? Or no, numbers? they were right in the same building, but, the, but they, the, they were the mathematicians, and they didn't get the information. We had to feed it to them. I don't know what they were doing, plotting something. Part of the data yeah. analysis. Then I worked with this this one black boy. He was he was really a genius. He was young, and but he, for some reason he liked me, so we would eat our lunch together, so to speak. And he was I, I said that I had to hire this uh, black woman to sit with my mother, who was very old then, to take care of my daughter. But I couldn't leave her with my daughter because she couldn't pick her up. She had heart trouble. So that Della Gurley used to come and sit with both of them. And uh, we were talking and he said, I didn't know that you all thought like that about your children. I said, well, why? He says, well, the, the only, said, My, we moved to a place in uh, Georgia and said, we hadn't been there a week when this white woman approached my wife and wanted to know if she'd sit with her baby. She, he says, as far as we could see, how was she to know that we weren't, wouldn't kill the child? She'd never laid eyes on us. Said, we didn't think that you all thought like that about your children. I said, well, you, that was a very peculiar white woman because I'd have never done that. I was very particular who sat with my child. But we do give off that, uh, that idea to people, I guess. Must have. Yeah, <laughs> we did with him. Well, you worked down there for a long time? Ten years. On the phone all the time? <laughs> no. Part of the time, I worked in the daytime at first. Then the last three years, I worked at night. I was, uh, whatever they didn't want to do, I did. For, <laughs> for instance, I had to usher in the gas. So Mr. Thomason, who was my boss, and his boss was Mr. Cole, he said I had to put my I had to put my desk here with my back to the door, fa facing the wall. At first, he said I had to face the wall. I said I wouldn't do it. He said you have to because you're being ordered to. I said I'll quit then because I won't face the wall. My job was to greet the guests when they came in. How can I greet the guests when my back was to the door? Well, I won that. He's, he, we went to Mr. Cole about it. Mr. Cole said that he agreed with me. So, so Mr. Thomason had to give face. But wasn't that a stupid thing? To have the person greeting you with a back to the door? I wouldn't have seen them when they came in. Then I had to fix the coffee. So they had this huge pot like this. And I told him, yes, I wouldn't mind making it if the man would wash the pot and lift the pot with the water. No, I had to do it. I said, Mr. Thomason, I will not do it. It's heavy. So I won that one. And you know, I was one of his favorite people. It's funny, he was, he had everybody in tears but me. He had me in tears once, but I wouldn't have, I'd have died before he knew it. <laughs> I always stood up to him. But that was so stupid. 